Hey there, welcome back to the Path to Zion podcast where we are rediscovering the ancient way. Thank you for tuning in today. Whether you're over at pathtozion.com or watching this video on YouTube, thank you for following along. You can always reach out to us via email at pathtozionpodcast at gmail.com. We love getting any email responses, thoughts, challenges, questions, um, some prayer requests, maybe needs you have in your life. We'd love to talk to you. Um, that's the way to do it. Today I want to get right to it because this is going to be multiple parts, I'm sure. And it, it basically is stemming from this question that I want to pose to you and I want you to just think about your answer. Um, and of course I won't know your answer, so you're safe. But how ready are you for what is coming in perhaps our lifetime um, and, of course, very likely in the lifetime of our children. Um, how ready are you? And, and even the question, I'm posing it very generally and generically on purpose so that, that you're, you're kind of challenged to think, well, ready for what? Exactly. <laughs> we don't know yet. We don't know how ready we are for anything that is to come in mere hours or days or years, we just don't know. We don't know how prepared we are for what's to come because in the specifics of it, we don't know what's to come. Now, now what we're going to do today is we're going to use the Bible to talk about some, some general baseline principles of preparation um, because... We can't just say, well, well, what then? What do we do if we don't exactly know what's coming? Aside from prophesied things in the scripture, of course, we're told many things. But as far as like what that will look like in my lifetime, in my day, outside my window right now, I don't really know exactly what's coming. Now, many people claim they know everything that's coming. They've got the inside source and, you know, they know through their secret news portal, what's about to happen on the earth. Friends, this is just hogwash many times. Now, I'm not saying no one knows the truth. There are individuals who know the truth. But, man, if it's coming through, like, <laughs> news only you get to hear about.com, I just don't buy it. There's there's no fake news and then real news. There's just, it's all, it's all... It's just foolishness. And so what do we do then? And so in light of that, I've just been thinking about some things the last two days specifically, and especially this morning. And I'd like to say that, that the Lord just led me to the book of Daniel. I'm no major prophecy, you know, I'm not revealing the deep layers of of the, the epochs of time and the timeline and the unraveling of prophetic things in the Word. No, I'm not doing that. And, and men can do that, and that's fine. But I think a lot of times if we're not careful in trying to understand and grasp and wrap our minds around prophecy and what we're told is coming, a lot of times if we're not careful, we miss the whole point. We miss the whole entire point of Daniel. Are there details within Daniel, within understanding when these things happen and like where are we? Yes, that's fine. But I'm saying that those things in, in this program today, pick all that up and put it over here. We're not doing that today. But instead, we're going to look at some basic <laughs> real life examples of some things that we can add to our life. Now, now this, this will be a series and and I titled it, Purposed in Our Hearts, A Call to Prepare for What is Coming. Purposed in our hearts, in our innermost places, a call to you, to the church, to anyone who has ear to hear. A call to prepare. Prepare for what is coming. What is coming? And we don't always have to answer that question. What is coming? Because if I know what's coming, I know how to prepare. Now, again, let's be fair and thorough. In many places in the Word of God, we are told certain things will come. 
in this book specifically and in others, real men put away and stored real food for real circumstances. We know that with men like Joseph and all these other individuals we could talk about. There was literal, natural planning. Yes, do this because Yahweh declared through the word of his prophets, this is coming. Prepare. Do these things. Now, we do that and in rightful measure, but today specifically, I want to speak to the point of this phrase, purposed in our hearts. Now, as I've already said, we're going to be in the book of Daniel, just the first couple of chapters, and we're going to extract some things within this account that I believe are absolutely hands down for us today, applicable to the right now. So, so right away in the book of Daniel, we're, we're introduced to some individuals, some some. Some, and I'm not going to take the time to read all this scripture. If you want to, stop this now. Read Daniel 1, 2, and 3. Just for a little bit of a refresher, perhaps, if you need that. Maybe you've already got it all memorized and you don't need that. I do sometimes, many times, if not every time. But we're introduced to these individuals that are, quote, some of a royal family and nobles. Okay, royal family and nobles, some individuals that are about to come on the scene here. Now, these men that we're told about in Daniel chapter 1 are not just nobodies. You know, we've all heard these stories, these Bible stories of how God took nobody and he made him a somebody and how God took a loser and made him a winner and how God took the everyday man and he made him a king. Yes, that is a biblical pattern. And many times, he took men who were already someone in the natural, the play out of life, of course, still governed by his hand to, to become these men. But it's not always just this from nothing to, to something people, okay? These were, were some of a royal family and, and nobles. And in verse 4, in Daniel chapter 1, these were youths in whom was no defect. They were even good-looking individuals, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge. And they had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And it goes on to talk about how the king appointed them. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. A daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank. And that they would be educated three years. And at the end of these three years of being taught and trained and educated, they would enter the king's personal service. So these men were already someone by birth. And then they were set to be, to be trained and conditioned to enter the king's court and servants. These were like excellent men. These were men that people would have looked at, even, I mean, we're not even talking about kingdom things, mindset, viewpoints. We're just talking as human beings now. Individuals would look upon these men that we're, we're being told and introduced to here, and they said, wow, these guys are the real deal. They're somebody. And they were desired. I mean, of course, as, as we already just read, very simply, this is no deep stuff here. The king noticed this, and he wanted them in his court. And so he's preparing them for that as the plan. Now, now this account, of course, in the book of Daniel at the beginning, is, of, is without question known to be what? The, the account of the fiery furnace. Um, and it starts with, with, with Daniel, when, when Daniel and his three friends... Um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You would know them, of course, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which is really silly because that's the, that's the names they were given <laughs> by, by men who were not Yahweh's men. And, and so it's interesting that they're kind of set in concrete in history, primarily under the names that, that were given to them that were not their given names. I don't much like that. Daniel, I mean, we, we know he goes on, what, Belteshazzar, something like that. 
Well, why don't we call him that? Why is he Daniel? I don't know. So Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah is who we're going to talk about. And and it picks up here in, in just verses that are after what we just read. I'm trying to decide in my head as I'm speaking what we're going to read and what we won't. But, but these men, Daniel specifically and presumably the other three, but Daniel for sure, we're told, he refuses to eat the king's meat. Okay? And, and if you know anything about the Old Testament and Yahweh's people and one of the ways they were marked and how they viewed food, it was very important. We've been talking about that a lot in our house. Um, you'll hear me in this series talk a lot about how I'm studying Ecclesiastes right now. And even in Ecclesiastes, which may conjure up certain thoughts in your mind towards that book specifically, talks a lot about because of how everything goes on in the earth, one of the best things you can do is feast, eat, find enjoyment and pleasure in eating. Now, we've been told in New Testament theology and thinking and teachings that like that's all just natural, fleshly, carnally driven indulgence. Well, of course it can be, yes, and we have to be aware of that, and we, we need to be masters and, and lords of our own flesh man cravings, of course, yes. But I think in that, again, extreme tipping of the scales, we fall to like, well, eating is just foolishness. It's a waste, or, or it's, it needs to only be you know this strict thing, even as people who eat pretty healthy in our home and have for years. But there was, a, there was an understanding in this Old Testament time, and, and that time period in that mindset was like food, food was, was sacred. Eating was more than what it's just become now. We eat all day long. Honey, grab me a bag of chips. Hey, you want to go to McDonald's? You want to go to the buffet? You want Chinese tonight? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Eating here has just become this mundane, repetitious flesh-driven thing we do, but that was not the case in this time period that we read about in Daniel. And so this food, of course, is presented to them, and I think it's safe to say with only a little bit of knowledge and looking into it even further, that, that the meat that would have been offered them, the king's meat, would have been unclean. It would have not been fit to be eaten by Daniel and these other men. Um... And, and verse 5 specifically speaks of how Daniel would not defile himself with the king's meat and wine. And so basically, there was something within that that we don't have time to unpack in its, in its entirety. Daniel was saying, no, that's not for me. That's, that's not for me. We'll get to why here in a little bit. But they only ate pulse. Depending on what version you read and what word studies you do, the, 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 the best word from the origin of the word that I can find is pulse. Now, pulse could be vegetables, um, but quite specifically, it was understood to be seeds. Um, very likely bread, because bread was with every meal, um, and water. And so, for sure, we know that they ate this pulse and water. Um, now, now we know, we know the account, and it's very fascinating, because over the course of this 10 days, there's all these decisions going on about a back and forth of, well, we'll do this, but we're not going to eat what everyone else is eating. And in a sense, they're saying, you're going to see after 10 days that, like, we don't have to have the defiled food of your palace. We don't have to have your choice food. We don't, we don't need that, okay? There's so many layers to this. We could spend days talking about it. But as we know the account, then this 10 days passes, and these, these four set-apart consecrated men who are not eating the unclean foods and just doing what everybody else is doing, they're eating very little. They grow in health and even in countenance. They even became, depending on versions again, more fat. Like they gained weight eating something that really in the natural should not do that. Now, now here in Christianity, we take all these principles that are within this and just stack the layers upon layers of knowledge and, and things we can add to our life. And what do we do? Daniel fast. We <laughs> eat green beans and water and you're on a Daniel fast and then you get 
the promises that are within Daniel and you're healthy. Well, that's not even the point, friends. The whole point, I'm not saying don't do a Daniel fast, but what I'm saying is we've got to get the point and purpose of why this stuff is in there. Tell me this, and then we'll move quickly on. Do you think when this was transpiring, Daniel had any inclination that someday thousands and maybe more of Western American Christians are going to be doing a Daniel fast? I mean, come on. We've got to do that, that's fine, but let's not leave and forsake the principles that are within what's going on and why. That's what ultimately matters. So, so let's insert a little snippet of thought here for you to kind of think about. Um, and before we move past the foods thing. Okay, so let's turn to Psalm, well I've got it here, Psalm 141. Now, now most Christians that I know would say the Psalms are absolutely for us. Now, what do you do with, like, Psalm 119 and what do you, well, all these things we could name that, ah, uh, let's just skip over that one. But in Psalm 141, let's just read this. So just a few verses, three, I believe. May my prayer be counted as incense before you, Yahweh, the raising of my hands as the evening offering. Set a guard over my mouth, Adonai. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice deeds of wickedness with people who do wrong, and may I not taste their delicacies. Now, this lends to what I was just talking about a few minutes ago, I believe. Eating. There's more to what you put in your mouth than what you think. Very likely. Now, there are a lot of people who understand this, and there are a lot of men who know this and understand it more than I presently do. This is somewhat new for me. But the sacredness and the, the ancient understanding of what you consumed that has not made it in any way whatsoever to today. Because in the, in the, in the Christian post-Yeshua, post-Jesus, let's use it accurately, church, anything goes. It does not matter, and we can jump to all these verses. I've had these conversations very recently with people. Verse after verse after verse to excuse the fact that eating and, and what goes into these temple bodies is sacred. That has been lost. That has been forsaken. By tradition, not, not by fact. I believe it's still intact, the sacredness of it. Um, and the defilement in it, that it can be. I believe that's still intact. It's just we're ignorant of it. We don't think about those things. In many cases, we don't even ask the question. This, that we could spend all day on that as well. So, so okay, may, the, ver, the reason I put this in here from Psalm 141 is because the verbiage lends it to be what, what I think Daniel was saying. I don't want to practice deeds of wickedness with people who do wrong, who eat Unclean animals. I will not taste their delicacies. In other words, I'm not going to join myself with them because that's what it meant back then. We know that through New Testament scriptures that have been twisted and tweaked and pulled and stretched to fit a New Testament Christian doctrine. But if we really understood what they were saying, they were, they were perpetuating what already had been. We just don't, we don't understand. Myself included. I'm just ignorant towards so many things. I've just not been told. I've not been taught in or, or instructed in the ancient way. And so thereby we miss what we're even supposed to be doing and not doing. So I would say Daniel is saying what Psalm 141 is saying, which is, I'm not going to join myself with the king in all the things that these men are doing in this way. And because it even talks about that I will not taste their delicacies. That's the Psalms verse. So it seems applicable to me that that's very likely what Daniel was saying. I'll be fine out here, thank you. It does, it's not like I'm going to die out here miserable. I'll be fine, which is the pattern of Daniel's life. So here's the question. And we're gonna, because this has to be talked about. This has to be talked about in the Christian church. So we're going to keep our, our thumb on this for another moment, and we're going to move on. So is, is all of this ne merely metaphorical now? about food, sacredness, defilement. In Christ, does anything defile a man? Well, we could name all these things that we won't get into. 
that would, well, that does, and that does, and that, but not, not what I eat. It doesn't matter. Can, well, can anything pollute or stain us? Because that's what defile, defilement means. In the here and now, can, is that possible in Christ? Or is what we literally consume and put into these holy temples, which is what we're told we are, is it all spiritually metaphorical alone? Or is it all what we call sin? Well, sexual immorality and all these things we could name. Well, that, of course, that. But what I eat doesn't matter. Well, the question is, friend, according to the word of God, why? Why can we be defiled by this like men always were, but not defiled like this like men were? It's a good question, I believe. What about food sacrificed to idols? Can this defile us? No, no, that doesn't matter anymore. Okay, well, Acts chapter 15, Shaul, Paul's talking about that. These these new believers are coming into the church and they're saying, we'll say metaphorically, well, what do we do? Just like anyone might say now today, coming into the church, born again, the revelation of Messiah, the the. The repentance, the, the teshuvah, turning away. Well, now what? They're, 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 they're hungry for the things of the Lord, whatever we want to call it in our Christian verbiage. They're hungry for change. Well, what? They, they come to Paul and they say, well, what do we do? What do we tell them? We don't want to, we don't want to stack too much on them so that the weight of requirement and expectation overwhelms them. Many people who think what you eat doesn't matter say they would say that the, they don't, we can't put the heavy burden of Torah on them because that's the old law. But that's, the, that's a poor translation of what this is saying in Acts. But we see, we see Paul say, do this. And he, yeah, we don't have time for all these things, but abstain from food sacrificed to idols is right there on the list. So does this matter anymore? That's Acts chapter 15, right? The apostolic church, right? Do you, friend, and, and we're going to move past this, but I just feel like every time we get on this topic, the, the, the mainstream Christian church has got to be at least given the opportunity to say, have you thought about this? Because that's, that's what got me, is someone just saying, have you thought about this? Have you read this text? Has anyone ever talked to you about that and asked you some tough questions? Whether or not we come up with a, 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 a knee-jerk reaction that says, what, that's ridiculous. That, is, that, makes no, that makes no difference whatsoever. This is the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that matters. What does the Word of God say? Or else I'm a lawless one, just like everybody else, that's on the outside of Yahweh's people. So we see Paul tell them, don't eat food sacrificed to idols. So let's, let's come all the way into present moment. Well, what about today? Because, again, that's not Deuteronomy. So what do we do with that then, church? Do you know at the food that you buy at Walmart, that pork that you buy at Walmart, the bacon that you eat every morning, do you know if that's been sacrificed to idols? Well, don't you know it's 2021, Joel? Come on, what are you talking about? Have you ever looked at packages of food that say Hallel on them? Do you know what that means? <laughs> it's been sacrificed to an idol. Okay? Now, you're not going to find pork because Muslims don't eat pork. Here's some irony for you. They believe it's unclean. It would defile them. It's an ancient understanding. They didn't come up with that idea either. It's scripture, <laughs> of all things. But there are plenty of things right now on the shelves of grocery stores in America that are sacrificed to idols. I don't think we think about that. I'm trying to train myself to think accordingly to that and know what I'm eating. Because I believe this can defile us. Because here, this is the same church age that we're in now in Acts, correct? Nobody can argue that. Everybody wants to argue preceding Yeshua and Pentecost, Acts 2 Pentecost. But this is inarguable. He says, don't do that. Well, what about that? Do you think about that? Until recently, I have not. 
I think it would be good for us to do so. Now, let's move on past the food thing. You can exhale and say, oh, okay, good. And then we'll make this part one here in just a moment. So Nebuchadnezzar there, uh, the, the king at the time, is he, he kind of likes doing what everyone before him has done. He's making an idol of gold. Some say historically, I found this interesting, I want to look more into it later, that, that this idol was set up at the same location of the Tower of Babel. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? And the edict was simple. When the music starts playing, the lyre and the harp and all this stuff starts happening, you bow down to the image of gold. Now, I'm not going to get into some things that I asked myself, like, because I'm a scrutinizer of the church that I'm within. And I look at, like, all right, modern day worship, cue the music, and you know what to do. You kind of hit the floor, if you know what I'm saying. The worship has started. Go. Do what you're supposed to do now. Worship the Lord. I don't know. I think there's some interesting connotations there, but we won't explore them today. But this seems kind of harmless, right? I mean, the music plays. You bow down beside you and beside all the hundreds of other people that are around here, perhaps more, very likely more. And you just, you know, go through the motions. You don't have to really worship from your heart. Just just do it. <laughs> But not for those who were determined to worship the Elohim of Elohims. Again, because we talk about this a lot on the program, but you may not know that. That's why God doesn't work. That's why you can't just pray to God. That's why we can't just talk about God. Because as I've said a lot lately, if you would have said that, that you're going to worship God tomorrow morning, People in, 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 in ancient culture would say, well, what God are you talking about, friend? You're talking about Baal? You're talking about Asherah? You're talking about I mean, who? who God? There's a million gods. That's why he is the capital E, Elohim, God of all gods. And, and we, it, it would do us well, I believe, to, to, to make that known. We, we see all these things in the prophesied scriptures about what? Those who know my name. This is for this one. This is for this one. This is for this one. Covenantal promises, blessings, protection, preservation. For what? For those who know my name. And his friend is not G-O-D, friend. That's just simple fact. And it's not my opinion. We don't have to get hung up on saying his name exactly right to understand that simple baseline principle of, of start, a starting point. He is not merely God. The world is full of and has always been full of gods. But this was a big deal to these consecrated set-apart men. Um, and so let's just end this here and we'll get to part two. And what we're going to begin to move into is the, the fiery furnace ordeal. We're going to talk about that for a little bit, and then we're going to step back a chapter previous and talk about some words, some verbiage that was said um, by Daniel. And what does this mean for us? Because, as we already said at the beginning, how ready are you? A lot of people would have a very well rehearsed answer i've done this i've done this i've done this i've done this or you know it could be a laundry list of things or god's going to take care of it that's your rehearsed answer god will take care of it he always does he promises and then you quote all these verses that assure you will just be fine but I'm saying, and I'm, and I'm presenting in this series, that you do not know yet. You do not know how you will fare. You do not know how it will go. You do not know that you will be spared trouble and trials and tribulations. So what then? So what do we do then? Well, we're going to get to that next, and, and this, we're going to get to the, in the next part why this is called, this title, Purpose in Our Hearts. And it is a call to prepare for what's coming. You're watching the Path to Zion podcast. We're rediscovering the ancient way. Go ahead and uh, share the video if you want to. Thank you for watching, whatever the case. We will be back for part two right after this. Amen.